Hi, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to Close Up with the Hollywood Reporter, Actors Edition. I'm Scott Feinberg, the Hollywood Reporter's awards columnist and host of its Awards Chatter podcast. Very honored to be joined today by six incredible actors who gave some of this season's most incredible standout performances. Uh, let's meet them one by one to begin with. Ben Affleck, star of Gavin O'Connor's The Way Back, in which he plays an alcoholic grieving a terrible personal loss who is hired to coach the high school basketball team for which he once starred. Ben, thank you. Uh, Sasha Baron Cohen, star of Aaron Sorkin's The Trial of the Chicago 7, in which he plays Abby Hoffman, an activist whose protest of the 1968 Democratic National Convention landed him and others on trial with the whole world watching. And also of Jason Welliner's Borat's subsequent movie film, in which he plays everyone's favorite Kazakh TV host, who returns to America, this time to offer his daughter as a child bride to Vice President Mike Penis. Delroy Lindo, star of Spike Lee's The Five Bloods, in which he plays a MAGA hat wearing Vietnam vet who is haunted by the death of one comrade and reunites with several others to return to the jungle where they lost him and hid a fortune. Delroy, welcome. Gary Oldman, star of David Fincher's Make, in which he plays Herman J. Mankiewicz, the brilliant screenwriter, wit and boozer, who draws upon his interactions with William Randolph Hearst as he writes the original draft of Citizen Kane. Gary, thank you. Steven Yun, star of Lee Isaac Chung's Minari, in which he plays the patriarch of a family that immigrates from Korea to America in the hope of finding a better life, only to encounter a number of daunting challenges. Welcome, Steven. And John David Washington, star of Sam Levinson's Malcolm and Marie, in which he plays a director who returns from the premiere of his first major film and clashes with the girlfriend who he forgot to include in his thank yous and of Christopher Nolan's Tenet, in which he plays a CIA agent who is dispatched on a mission involving the mysterious process of inversion. Gentlemen, thank you all so much for being here, even at a truly bizarre time in uh, all of our lives. And I thought that might be a good place to begin. Um, we're obviously speaking in the midst of a global pandemic, massive social unrest in the United States. Um, most people have watched the movies that bring us together today at home because most movie theaters are still closed. Many will not reopen. I just wonder how you think the business will be different after everyone is vaccinated and things get back to quote unquote normal. I don't know. I mean, who knows? The business was changing a lot, uh, especially in terms of a lot of the kind of movies that that you just mentioned, like particularly dramas were sort of largely going away, I think having to do with theatrically, having to do with competition from like extraordinary, amazing stuff on streaming services and uh, it just being hard to price and the expense of getting you know adults out of the house on weekends. And so they were kind of migrating that direction anyway. And I think now people have been kind of taught to that you're gonna just watch at home and that's fine. It'll be very hard to get those kinds of movies back out in theaters. I mean, if I had to guess, I would say that probably theaters, you know, like probably in 2006, there were 300 movies released theatrically. And I think excluding kind of, you know, qualifying theatrical releases and stuff like that, there'll probably be 40 movies a year that come out. Maybe, you know, there'll be uh, mostly, you know, action effects, you know, temple sequels, superhero, that, that kind of movie that you can really count on. Um, but who, who knows? I mean, I, I, I'm no expert and I have no idea and I don't really know um, whether they make their money or not in the same way from streaming. It's a kind of a veiled thing, you know, with box office, they, they report it. This is how much money, this is how many tickets got sold. Um, you know, you don't really know who watches it on streaming. Um, Sasha has access to that information, but no one else. Well, in all seriousness, though, for those of you guys who are here with projects that are on streaming services, uh, is that information that is shared with you? Is that information that makes you feel more or less encouraged about uh, this potentially new model moving forward? Well, I, I, I think for some, um, it's, uh, it's a blessing that, you know, you, you, make a, you make a movie with, let's say, Netflix, you don't have to have an opening weekend. You don't. It, uh, you don't have those particular pressures. And um, what does it count that you've watched a movie where where they they calibrate how many you know they how 
they, they, they log how many people are watching. I think it's like two minutes or something. If you've clicked on and watched for two minutes, then it counts as a view. So, um, you know, there, I, I love long form. I love watching, the, I, I enjoy the streaming services uh, like everyone else. Um, but I was uh, recently in London and uh, the Mank was playing at the Curzon Cinema, which was just l literally a three minute walk from the, uh, from the hotel. And, uh, and, and, and one night I thought, I've never seen this on the big screen. You know, um, I'll, I'll, I'll go along and see it and find out what the, what the other customer uh, thought of it. And um, so, there, so I went to the Curzon, there was about 11 people in the audience. But, but there was something said for being in this big space in a dark room, watching this thing 40 feet across, it played faster. I think uh, it, it felt the gags were working and certainly the guy behind me was having a good time. So there's, I think there's advantages and disadvantages. It's, it is wonderful to sit in the comfort of your own home and, 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 and watch something at will. Um, and, and there's also something to be said about having a, a, a community experience in a, in a, in a room. And I, I, I don't know when we're ever, when we're going to get back to that. I, I was just going to say, I mean, one of the things that's an advantage is I don't know that, uh, I think your movie, Gary, that you made with David is magnificent. I think it's a masterpiece. It's my favorite of David's movies. I think it's his most human and movie i mean i also happen to identify with being an aging alcoholic screenwriter so maybe i'm biased <laughs> but uh you know it's i think it's incredible and i don't know that somebody right now in the studio theatrical world like you're right like you have a giant amount of pressure to have that movie do a bunch of money in the first weekend and you know netflix is doing really 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 interesting brave stuff and yeah. that is an example so it's the fact that that got made, I probably because you know it was a streaming service that made it, and I'm I, I'm just you know glad it happened. So I want to ask John David about his experience over the past year because you've had kind of every way that a pand the pandemic could affect things. I mean, Tenet is was going to be the this is a movie obviously like all Nolan movies that are intended for the big screen, uh, best on the big screen. And it's still, you know, he put his foot down and wanted it there, held out for it to be there at a time when so a lot of theaters were not open. So some people so got that experience. Others have now are now catching up on on streaming. But then con on, in contrast, you had Malcolm and Marie, which was entirely conceived of, written, acted, edited during the pandemic. So I guess I just wonder, you know, what having been through both of these kinds of uh, and is now, by the way, out on, uh, you know, streaming on Netflix. So just your, your experience with how this has affected plans. Well, um, I equally experienced terror, panic, worry, uh, insecurity um, for different reasons, but, but equally the equal amount. You know, obviously with Christopher Nolan, who I, you know, I think he's one of the best to ever do it as a director. Um, he, you know, he has a plan, he has um, a formula and uh, uh, with his rollouts. And um, I, I appreciated uh, Warner Brothers and, uh, you know, working with Syncope and, and them honoring um, those wish wishes and how it was intended to be seen. Um, so the worry was for me always is like, oh, here I am, got get my, this huge opportunity <laughs> and it's not gonna get uh, the same treatment as his films had before. Um, so um, thinking about Malcolm and Marie, where we self-financed, I mean, I paid to play and you know, I didn't get paid to, to do that. You know, I, I believed in it that much, but then it becomes, wait, are, we, are we crazy? Is this something that, um, do we miss it? Do we, do we, do we miss something Netflix uh, thought enough to, um, to believe in it? But uh, you still have these worries about, uh, is it going to work at the end of the day? Is it a movie that people are gonna connect to? Um, you know, some people like it, some people won't, but uh, will they have a reaction to it, an actual reaction? And uh, that's something that I, I, I do um, look for. And, uh, and it's going to happen for both. 
I know that you guys, and we should emphasize, took every precaution <laughs> possible to make that Malcolm and Marie shoot safe and, you know, uh, secure during the pandemic. Um, another movie that was shot during the pandemic was Barat's subsequent movie film, as we see with, uh, you know, Sasha at staying with these QAnon guys um, and performing at the March for Our Rights protest against lockdowns. And I want to ask you, Sasha, about just how safe you felt during that process. But I know maybe even more than the pandemic, you were literally physically at risk at certain times during that shoot, right? Um, yes. I, I was at risk at some times. I mean, I tried obviously to everything I could do to limit my own risk and that of the crew. Um, I mean, actually on that subject, on the first day of shooting, um, about a year ago, the first day of shooting was at a gun rights rally in Richmond, Virginia. And it reminded me a little bit about, of the uh, images that I saw coming out of DC. There were a lot of militia there. Everybody had come battle ready, a lot of machine guns, um, some people with armored vehicles. And um, that was kind of the first day of shooting. I was gonna run through there with a rather insulting message for the NRA, which Borat is wearing accidentally. And it, it you know, it was an interesting experience. I mean, that was prior to the pandemic, obviously. Um, once the pandemic hit, then, uh, you know, I believe we were the first movie out to shoot during the pandemic. It seemed crazy at the time. And, you know, what we basically did was we were like, okay, who are the experts on coronavirus? Probably not the president and vice president. So we went to Johns Hopkins and we found their experts on pandemics and they kindly enough helped us devise a system that would keep us relatively safe. I mean, things like that rally that you're talking about, uh, the sort of second gun rights rally that I went to, that was a bit, you know, a bit more dangerous because you know, we were told that if they felt people were not Republicans or pro-gun, they'd get COVID positive people to spit at you. And that's quite apart from the risks of people getting shot, you know, because we were obviously antagonizing them. Um, so yeah, there, there were some risks. Um, you know, the crew was incredibly brave. They were, you know, I said to everyone, you know, we don't, we're gonna try our best to keep you safe. We spent a million dollars of the budget for testing and PPE. I mean, <clears> what was really tragic was we had some nurses who had been working in ICU in New York. And they said it was the first time that they'd been given proper PPE. You know, these women had been working in the ICU in New York during the pandemic. Um, but yeah, I mean, fortunately, nobody got sick mm -hmm. on the production and... Um, yeah, we got the movie done despite having we got shut down a number of times, obviously. Uh, I want to turn to Delroy. Most of you guys had not previously worked with the director of your film, Ben. I know you'd worked with Gavin on The Accountant before, but Delroy, you actually have an un incredible history with Spike Lee. I think your screen career really launched with the three films in four years that you made with him back in the early 90s, Malcolm X, Crooklyn, and Clockers. And then it was 25 years uh, before you guys reunited on this project. And so I just wonder, how did that relationship get going? And then why such a long hiatus? Um, if it's OK, before I answer that question, just really quickly, uh, your first question that you uh, asked some of the other actors um, with regard to the pandemic and how, how it has impacted filmmaking. One thing that Spike said to me um, right before uh, uh, Bloods was hit, it dropped. And this is in context of the film having been scheduled to go to Cannes, which of course we all wanted to do. Um, and having seen the film, feeling very strongly that it needed to be seen on a big screen, but Spike said to me, because of the pandemic, 
more people would see the film than had ever seen any of his films in the past. And from Spike's point of view, despite my own personal disappointments around the whole can thing and the rest of that, from Spike's point of view as a filmmaker, I appreciated that, that our work would be seen, the film would be seen much more broadly than it otherwise may have been uh, seen. With regard to um, Spike uh, and my relationship, um, interestingly, it was to, to reconnect after 25 years was um, relatively seamless. Obviously, we've both gotten older, but in terms of the work process, making the work, it was relatively seamless. And that's one of the, one of the components that I cherish about working with Spike. And the fact that it was this particular material at this particular time just, just heightened my appreciation of the whole, whole thing. But the, answer, the short answer to your question is, it didn't feel like 25 years. And we just kind of eased back into working as we had back in 1996. Yeah. Um, Steven, you have a fascinating origin story here with Minari. Uh, I, you didn't even necessarily realize, or I, I believe there was a, a, rel a relation to the filmmaker that was not apparent even to you. Can you just take us back to how this crossed your radar and how it all, it seems like it was kind of fated to happen in the end. I just got, it was, uh, this movie came together really quickly. Um, I got the script in 2000, like October of 2018. And it was uh, uh, our agent, mutual agent at the time, Christina Chow. She was like, hey, I represent your cousin. And I was like, who's, who's my cousin? What are you talking about? And, um, and she was like, you know, Isaac. And I was like, oh, shit, you, uh, excuse me. You could like, oh, you, uh, okay, cool. Oh, shit. Like, you represent Isaac. That's so insane. I'd only met him. He's my wife's cousin. And I only met him at our wedding and then a previous wedding, maybe two, three years before. And then I'd never really spoken to him before. I saw his first film, which was like one of the first films I saw with my wife uh, 10 years ago. Uh, Lin Yang Rangabo. And I, I'll be honest, like, I, I didn't know how to appreciate it then, because I was just just a starving improviser in Chicago. So I, to be, I, it was just like, I didn't know what was happening. And then to come back full circle and then be given his script um, was wild, because he wrote something that I wanted to say, maybe my whole professional life. And um, it just presented itself like that. And so we went from me reading that script in October to us shooting in June to then us premiering at Sundance 2020. And so, the thing that you had wanted to say, I, I would love to ask you, but I just want to set this up by noting that you've had an incredible last couple of years between Okja and Burning and all, you know, everything you've done. But I want to particularly set this up with those two because in a sense, the characters that you've played were people who were caught between cultures. And I think that actually was maybe the thing from what I understand that gave you some pause about doing Minari. Mm. And so just how you looked at that would be interesting. It's been pretty strange and probably mostly just from my, my personal point of view, it feels profound, but um, this whole year has been a, beyond the obvious things, been a wild, uh, trip um to kind of go from okja where i played like a korean american kid who's caught between worlds doesn't know where he fits um to then go to play burning to play a korean national that's like super worldly that's kind of beyond any cultural specificity he's just kind of a man above society and then to get to play you know a version of my father's generation in America. I mean, all those sequentially kind of had to happen in that sequence in order for me to, I think, properly approach those things. Um, but I think like the craziest part has been the, like thinking about this year, the theme of isolation and just the theme of, of, of just being caught in your own little 
void, um, which is scary and terrifying and uh, lonely, but also so true. Um, and then to have this year reflected back like that was was crazy, um, especially because uh, Minari actually created connection for me by like so going so deep into the isolation it actually created connection to an understanding of my father's generation or just an understanding of each other you know just the the humanity of each other because so, your, your personal journey and i mean isaac's is essentially <clears throat> the one that inspired the film and that you guys are playing but it's not all that different from your own families right you know we're playing an immigrant existence in that film and um we're not really focusing on the external parameters of an uh, immigrant existence. It's really such a human film. It's really just about a family, um, a father, a mother, kids, grandmother, and just seeing each other a little bit clearer. Um, and all the while, I think maybe the larger theme that can bring it together is that this family is isolated. Um, within themselves and then even within their family, they're all isolated. And it takes time and it takes um, sometimes tragedy to see each other a little bit clearer. And uh, yeah, this, yeah, I mean, all that to say is it's been crazy. <laughs> I wanna come back to Ben for a second because I, I wonder, you know, you've, you've had over the last decade, let's say a bunch of films that you have directed and in most cases starred in I mean it started a little over a decade ago with Gone Baby Gone which you were not in but since then we've seen the town Argo live by night is it uh is it something that you find an easy adjustment to go back to just acting for somebody else and and being in their movie um and particularly in this case if you can talk about just the the state of mind that you were in when you had to go to work yes it's an easy adjustment to to go into for me to act in something that i'm really attracted to and drawn to and that resonates with me like in the case of this movie was not only attractive and easy in that sense although some things you know are were hard about it it was wonderful and kind of cathartic and reminded me why i love and started acting in the first place. Um, it's, it was like even scenes that were emotional or upsetting or in some way, like I was thrilled and, and exhilarated and ecstatic at the end of the day and reminded me how lucky I am, how lucky I am to have this career and have the opportunity to do this, to get the chance to work on something that not only resonates with me, but I hope resonates with other people. I mean, and, and I have to say something else, you know, I'd seen all you, I'm really, pleased and, and honored and flattered to be in the same Zoom call with uh, all of you. You guys have all done amazing performances. I saw all your movies, except Malcolm and Minari, which I saw last night. And that movie, that performance, John, that you turned in is one of the best things I have ever seen. That, I, I don't know, you could, I'm saying this, you say they connect with people or not. I, it was so real to me and so authentic and so kind of um, elusive and, and kind of magic, like just when a performance works and everything just, it's all comes together at once in this very mysterious way where the character is insecure and you see his ego and he's, he's jealous and he's angry and he's I mean, frustrated and, and, and celebrating it. I mean, it was so fucking good that I just wanted to, before I like, I was the last time I say anything, I just want to tell you that I was blown you were fucking spectacular in that movie it was as i don't know because you were talking about like it was during the pandemic and it was in tech or whatever it was or i also as i was saying to gary there's i've had some experiences similar to I, it was so, so real in some ways to me that i just was like this you know that that performance and i was great and i identified with everything like with not everything that happened to your character but just everything you did felt so real and powerful and complex um, I, I bring it up both to, just to compliment you and, and, and to thank you for such an amazing performance. And also because like, that's exactly the kind of character and the kind of thing that I find interesting and want to play. And in a way, it's, I guess it's the hardest thing to do because it is complicated and, and, and tricky. But like with this character in, in The Way Back, you know, um, is contrary, flawed. You know, you're allowed to be a real person. 
And, um, and that is the kind of thing that was really, really, um, that is, I love doing and really kind of want to really mostly do. And, and, you know, um, my criterion for sort of at this stage, you know, in my life, as I sort of segue into, you know, I'll be 50 in two years, <clears throat> you know, I have three children I want to spend time with. I have a life that I really enjoy. And, and, and I also really love, I, I want to really love my work. And I, I want to do the, these kinds of movies that tell these kinds of stories with characters that are as rich as the ones that you all portrayed, um, you know, watching Mank made me think like, God, I, 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 I have to direct it. And this is so magnificent. This movie, I, it, it's all of you guys, it, it's those um, to me, like you, you all here are a representation of what is really interesting uh, to me about acting and why I love doing it so much um, and why, you know, what I'm trying to do uh, when, when I do do it. So uh, just to just to come back, though, for one sec to talk about, I mean, what what people have been so impressed about, I think, about your performance is how and I'm talking to Ben here for a second more is just about, you know, how uh, raw and real it, it does feel. And I think part of that as you've spoken about is because it was coming from a very raw and real place, literally the day you arrived on set. I mean, right. Yeah. Well, that's a slight exaggeration, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess you're referring to the fact that I'm a recovering alcoholic. And I play an alcoholic in the movie. And it's about, it's really about grief and loss and losing a child, which thank God, you know, I have not experienced. I think it's probably the worst thing you can experience, but also a lot of it about alcoholism. Um, alcoholism in and of itself and compulsive behavior are not, um, necessarily inherently super interesting. Um, but what is interesting is the, the personal process that you kind of go through, what you discover about yourself sometimes in the course of, of recovery and, and um, trying to figure out sort of what went wrong and how to fix it and how you want your life to look and, and what kind of ethics you want to live by and that kind of thing. And for me, the way back represented not so much like, yes, I'm an alcoholic. Yes, I had uh, a relapse. I went into recovery again and um, and then went and did that movie. Um, but it really didn't have much to do with thinking about alcohol or alcoholism or, you know, it, for me, that movie was much more about um, the fact that whether it's having lived enough years, having seen enough ups and downs, having children, of course, having experienced a lot of different things. I'm at a point now in my life where I have sufficient life experience to, um, bring to a to a role to make it really interesting for me um i'm not good enough to just uh invent it from whole cloth you know and um so having had a, a growing older and having had more intense and meaningful personal experiences has made acting in general much more interesting for me and in turn made me drawn to the kinds of movies that are um you know that are about people that are really interesting and flawed and that, you know i i i, I do think um, yes, I didn't have to do the research for the alcoholism aspect of the movie that was covered. It was the sort of Daniel Day Lewis approach to that. Uh, but the the um, but really, you know, it's like the the things that for me that were interesting and resonant about that experience were the ability to tap into a a, a broad range of emotional experiences, and um, that has kind of stayed with me. That feeling and that excitement in the movies I've done subsequently, and it's been a, a just really kind of enriching uh time and i and i love working with gavin and i love so we're talking there about a sort of a uh turning point maybe in in ben's life ben's career i want to follow up on what ben said about john david which is this is a amazing performance and an amazing year for you and i want to ask you to kind of talk about just in your own mind how it feels to you know you knew you were a football star before you were an actor you knew when you were, when that, a when star. You, I want to start. I want to start. Okay. A standout. <laughs> yeah. uh, when, when that, when an injury made that no longer possible, you, you decide to get into acting, acting, knowing that, you know, you have two parents who are uh, tremendous talents in this business and that you're going to have to hear all kinds of comparisons and knocks and questions and all of that. How does it feel? I think at this point, whatever you had to deal with at the beginning to have now had a year like you've had and come basically, I think, come through the other side. Nobody, I, I would imagine, is going to be questioning at this point, like, does this guy belong here? 
does that feel like a load off your shoulders at this point? Um, I, you know, I, I uh, still a bit overwhelmed with what uh, what Ben said. So thank thank you so much, and I, I feel the same way about everybody here. I mean, Delroy. I mean, the OG. You know, um, uh, I have I've an experience with Spike Lee, and I feel like I'm forever connected to you just because of that. You know, and I've never seen a set with so many people that look like us before. So that, so that whole thing, Amen. this is crazy. Like that, uh, but to, to answer your question, um, like, no, uh, I still feel like, you know, that's what football also uh, did for me. Is I, I was able to, you know, accumulate all these different experiences and, and filter them through this thing or apply them where they were necessary. In my experience, guys, you know, guys get cut every day. Um, people get, you know, auditions or workouts every Tuesday. So I don't care what number I am on the call sheet. This could be my last day. They might decide, you know, we can replace them. I'm at the table read. I can get replaced. I'm, I'm at the dinner, you know, having a, a general with a, with a, with the director. I'm going to be myself because what I got to lose, I've been cut before. So um, I'm always feeling like I was watching that, the Jordan documentary and like he would find any excuse to, to get, you know, the psychological advantage. So like for me, even if it's not that the reality is maybe I've arrived, I don't think so. I don't feel that way. I always have something to prove. And, uh, and that's equally because of my father and my mother equally, because I respect them as artists uh, so much. But uh, what has helped me is getting, um, you know, like being able to work with a Spike Lee and him believing in me, Christopher Nolan believing in me, um, you know, Sam Levinson believing in me with, with, the, with all this text. Um, so that is encouraging. Uh, a current director I'm working with now, him believing me to, to have the responsibility to tell a story, their story. And uh, with some of these great directors, in my experience, it, it's not their story, it becomes our story. You know, I feel like I'm involved. I feel like um, I'm a colleague. So in that regard, it, it makes the ease of having to prove thing, prove something uh, a little less, you know. Yeah. And, um, so it's, you know, it's, it's definitely internal. It's something I always, uh, you know, I'll deal with. But uh, overall, you know, that's, that's just how it is for me. Yeah. Um, a different uh, thing. I mean, Gary, you've been at the top of your game for for decades now, and I think it's interesting that I read you and Fincher first cross paths like in 1990. We're talking like 30 plus years ago. Um, you guys have that was, I believe, over something to do with Aliens Three. Then, I mean, you guys have, I believe, known each other since then. I I think you have an ex wife in common. You guys have a lot of uh, <laughs> background. Um, and yet it was not until <laughs> now that a hell of a thing to have in common. <laughs> it wasn't until <laughs> into the middle of the question. Well, no, I mean, it's not until <laughs> now that uh, we finally get to see you guys work together. Why would, you know, is that tell, talk about what made it happen well, now? Well, I think there's, yeah, I've known, I've known David for, for, for a long time. Um, there's, there's, Two different, there's two different types of director. There's a director that you meet and they say, oh, I love your work. We should do something together. And you never hear from them again. Right. right. And then there's the other director who says, we got to work together. And then they try and sort of manufacture something and they try and put a, a, a round peg into a square hole. You know, they're trying to kind of engineer something that is just really not going to work or is not the right fit. I think David picks up the phone when he feels that you're right. Um, he's not just, he's not just going to just cast you. I think if something comes along that he feels that, that, that you're, that you're right for, then you, then you get the call. So really I had, I, um, had, I thought, well, I'll never probably tick that box. Uh, but uh, and then, like these things do, as we all as we all know, and I'm sure uh, uh, Delroy, after you know, 25 years, you know, something falls from the sky. Amen. And you go, what? Oh, okay, David Fincher, right. um, and then uh, reading the you know reading the the, the material, and then. Uh, in, in imagining the, the, the movie in, in your head when you're reading it as we do, but with, with the added edge of, of David, you know, I could only just barely grasp at what he could do with this era, the period, uh, 
the golden age of Hollywood. Um, so but there was something that gave you some pause, right? I mean, I read that here, you know, you you recently, very recently won an Oscar for playing another real person under a lot of makeup and hair and yeah. padding and all that. In this case, he's saying to you, we want you to play a real person, Mankiewicz, with nothing, no makeup, no hair, no... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it isn't something I personally go out of. I don't necessarily go out of my way. To, uh, I, I do love the the disguise and the dressing up aspect of of what we do because that is that that's a, that is a lot of fun. But I don't get on the phone to the agent going, "You've got to get me a prosthetic role." I mean, these things these things come and they go and they come across your desk. Um, but uh, it's all based on, and it got a little, it goes to what John was saying. Um, I like a disguise because of my own insecurity. It's nothing to do with David. It's nothing to do with Chris Nolan. It's nothing to do with Oliver Stone or any of these people. It's my insecurity. And when I can hide I feel, I, I feel a need to hide because it, 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 it makes me feel more comfortable. I don't, I don't know what it is, but it, it comes back to not being worthy. The, the, you know, like, uh, like, like Ben, you know, I'm now, I'm coming up to 24 years of sobriety in March. And, um, but I, re I remember all, all, the, all, the, all those things that m made me want to wanna drink, you know. Um, so these are all my own insecurities. So when, I, when David said, I want you naked, I want you as naked as you've ever been. I do not want a veil between you and the audience. It, all that, it just played into Gary's insecurities. And and, uh, and he just said, "Trust me, trust me, trust me." And um, anyway, as Ben knows, having worked with David, you know, uh, he, I couldn't persuade it. He wasn't having it. <laughs> so there, so you go, okay. So I'm going to go naked with this. And really, it was the best call. And, and, and oddly enough, after a couple of days on the bicycle. You know, it was it was rather uh, it was rather uh, liberating. Nice, nice. Yeah. Well, um, I want to turn to Sasha because people may not know, but uh, Borat goes back many years to Ali G show, right? But even further back is your association, in a sense, with Abby Hoffman. And I wonder if you can just talk about how you first became interested in him, why you lobbied for that part for years. And also, and I know this is a, a long question, but I think it can all be wrapped up in one. Um, you know, when you achieve as much success as you've achieved making people laugh, the minute we see you, we want, we're ready, we're bracing ourselves to laugh. Did you have any concern that that might prevent people from being, whether it's filmmakers or audiences, from being willing to accept you as a more serious person? Firstly, how did I come across Abby Hoffman? Um, when I was 20 years old, I was staying in the YMCA in downtown Atlanta next to the Martin Luther King Center, uh, researching a thesis on Jewish involvement in the civil rights movement in the 60s. And Abby Hoffman was one of a bunch of Jewish sort of radicals who went down south and uh, to support voter registration for people of color. Um, and later that group of mainly Jewish radicals then became the basis for the anti-Vietnam war movement. So I heard about him from the age of 20. Then, um, I heard that Spielberg was making a movie about the Chicago Seven uh, with, you know, characteristic chutzpah. I called him up and asked him whether I could audition. And so this was 13 years ago. And actually Aaron Sorkin was the writer. And um, 
I remember Spielberg was concerned that I would get, be able to do the accent because all he'd seen me do was ball rap, the first ball rap. And he put me with a dialect coach and he said, you know, okay, in two weeks time, I want this speech done as Abby Hoffman in the right character. With the dialect coach, every night we recorded at the beginning and end of the session for two weeks. So we'd recorded, we recorded the same speech twice. So um, by the end we'd had, you know, we had about 25 recordings on this CD. And at the beginning it was dreadful. You know, I sounded like a Northwest London Jewish guy trying to do Abby Hoffman, who's this, you know, Boston radical who'd sort of, uh, had sort of influences of Brandeis University in Berkeley, a very specific accent. It was dreadful, like start off unbelievably bad. By the end of the two weeks, I kind of, you know, the dialect coach felt I'd nailed it. I said to my assistant, you know, Steven Spielberg wants, you know, put take 48, put it on a separate CD, deliver it to Steven's house by 9 a.m., at lunchtime, I meet up in Stephen's mother's kosher restaurant called Milk and Honey. <laughs> His mother was there. His late mother was there. And Stephen sits me down and he says, listen. He goes, I got the CD. Thank you very much. He goes, I've got to be honest. He goes, the first 15 takes were not very good. And I was like, what? He goes, by take 20, you're getting good. And by take 35, it was almost perfect. By take 37, it was absolutely perfect. And I realized my assistant had given the wrong CD. She'd given 38 takes to Steven Spielberg. And Steven Spielberg, Spielberg had listened for over an hour to the same Spielberg. <laughs> <laughs> How many more minutes was she employed by you after that? I'll say, what's her name? What's her name? <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievably, she's actually gone on to be a very successful producer, and I kept her on for another year. <laughs> it's been like, this <laughs> guy's story story gets... unbelievable. Was there listen to 50 tapes? He listened for an hour and 50. That's why Steven, Sp Steven Spielberg, right? It's like all of us. You've got to have talent, but you've got to work your ass off as well. That guy, Steven Spielberg, because he listened to... I mean, the first 20 takes were so bad. They were like, hello, my name's Abby Hoffman. And, you know, <laughs> it's a dustman from the, from the East End. So, yeah. And so somehow he still went ahead and he's like, all right, great. The accent's perfect. We're going to make sure that still kept me in the job. Then the writer's strike happened. And um, tragically, I mean, it was an amazing cast, but... Um, Tragically, two of the cast members are no longer with us. Um, and so I stayed, I knew I had to play this character. And over the years, there were different directors. I'm sure it came onto your, was offered to you at one point, Ben. Um, no need to- It was not it. offered to me. It was not offered to me. It was not offered to me with Delroy playing Abby It was not offered to me, okay. No, and, and me neither, we even with Priscilla. <laughs> and then, yeah, 13 years later, I asked whether, I mean, it was a cheeky question as well, whether there's any way they'd reconsider me for a role of a, like a 35 year old that I'd, Spielberg cast me in. And somehow Aaron agreed to do it. So, um, yeah, it, it all turned out. And Aaron being the writer and director ended up ended up being a lot more powerful actually coming out just before the election than it would have done coming out 13 years ago. And I can't remember the last question you had. Uh, that'll be fine, that'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, what thank a story. you, great story, yeah. yeah. Um, Delroy, I think one of the things that's really fascinating to people about The Five Bloods is that Spike uh, has Spike made the decision to ask the these guys, the return, the older vets now, to play themselves as younger people during the during the flashbacks. And I wonder, did that throw you? Was that exciting to you? I believe it was a budgetary driven decision, but it actually feels perfect to me. It was a budgetary decision perfect. mixed with Spike's genius. And what I mean by that is he took lemons and made lemonade, uh, which is what we have to do oftentimes. Um, when I read it in the script, it, I didn't miss a beat. It, for whatever reason, it felt completely natural, and organic, and the right thing to do in the context of making the film. 
it was even more ripe because we had been working for five or six weeks before Chadwick arrived. So by the time we were filming the scenes with Chadwick, it felt right that we, as the age we are now, were going back in time as we are to revisit this younger norm. So it, it felt completely organic and uh, natural and, it's, and, it, and it works and it works. I have to just, just say a couple of things, please, if, if, I, if I may. When you were speaking, Ben, and you were speaking so effusively about your process and, and what the work means to you, and I think we all share that, as an added bonus on top of the passion and the desire uh, and the, just the plain hard fucking work that we bring to this process, the fact that we are, we, we, we engage this work as we do, and then for whatever reason we are singled out, and in being singled out, we get to spend time together like this, uh, and that makes it extra special. Uh, and, and, and in that context, um, I want to ask the actors I need to ask, because I'm on the verge of uh, directing my first film. Uh -huh. And I need to I need and want to ask the actor directors in the room how you do it. Um, because some of the things that have occurred to me, um, do I film all my scenes? I'm trying to figure out a way of filming my scenes separately so that I can then concentrate on the rest of the material. Uh, that may or may not work. I'm curious to hear from the um, actor directors um, because we may never meet again, how, what your experience was, if you don't mind. Um, um. The, I just had this conversation, Michael B. Jordan's a friend of mine and, I, and I, he's starting to direct, he's directing his first uh, movie soon. And um, I just had this conversation with him and, and I agree uh, with you, the real um, treat and pleasure and joy of this experience is like to get to, to sit down, I mean, I would prefer we're in an actual room, but to get to meet you all and listen to you and the, all of you artists who I so profoundly admire and whose work is, it moves me so much. This is in a lot of ways, I mean, in, in some ways it seems like, you know, here we are just promoting our movies and, you know, flogging it and that kind of thing. But really it's actually so much more joyful and enlightening and educational to hear from you all directly. It's an enormous treat. And it's the kind of thing you want to ask while you're sitting there and watching the movie and to get the chance to do it is wonderful. Um, what I said to Michael and what people have, I asked everybody to before I did it and I didn't act in my first one because I was intimidated. I thought it would be too hard to be acting and directing. Um, and I asked a bunch of other actor and directors. And one of the things that, that actually was oddly most helpful was I, I had a chance to talk to Warren Beatty. And I said, like, what was it that made you feel confident enough that you could actually do it? Because there's a lot of mystification of the process and a lot of, of uh, people who sort of want to set you back from it. And a part of that is directors who just don't want people interfering with them. And so they go, like, it's too complicated. You wouldn't understand it. First of all, I think ultimately actors, frankly, and, and brilliant actors like you make good directors because um, the most important thing in my view about directing is taste. And you so clearly have that and it's not going anywhere. And really ultimately it comes down to what do I think is interesting? What moves me? What do I think is good? You know that, no one can take it away from you. It'll always be there, it's your instinct and what resonates with you will resonate. And, and like sticking with that voice for me is, um, is the way to do it and it's the kind of thing i look for in, in act in directors that i that i work with you know do i think they have good taste david i think is you know is an example of a guy with extraordinary taste and also you know the the, the soul and taste of an artist and the mind of an engineer and he's this rare kind of monster uh, uh who is so brilliant that it's almost overwhelming but you don't have to be as brilliant as as david you can just be a, an ordinary guy hey, hey ben like me. ben I, I'm at, just for the record, I'm more brilliant than David Fincher. So just, I'm just saying. Okay, good. I'm, well, I'm just saying, man. I don't have that issue. Go ahead. That's exactly what Warren Beatty said. I said, Warren, how do you feel confident directing movies? And he said, have you ever been sitting on a movie that you were acting in and looked over at the director and thought, if this asshole can do that. <laughs> well, mind. That's a, that we look forward to seeing your film, Delroy. And I want to go to Stephen because we have on this panel a bunch of guys here who, in these roles that we're talking about, have you know just incredible long 
verbose, but in a, in the best sense, uh, monologues. Delroy, I think you have a, a four minute two camera monologue in your film. Gary, you've got several unbelievable ones. John David, between the 40 Legos and a mule and all the different ones in your film, it's amazing. Uh, Jacob, who Stephen plays, is is a very is I think a man of few words, soft spoken, um, but has manages to convey so much. And so I just wonder when you see a character who doesn't have a ton of dialogue on the you know on the page, is that daunting or exciting to you? How do you look at that when you're approaching the the job? That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> sometimes I actually prefer that. That actually makes me uh, feel more free about it. Um, because it, you know, what I've at least found for myself is that a lot of the work, I mean, most of the work if, is, is, is internal anyhow. Um, and sometimes, you know, when you read, uh, a lot of dialogue, it gets tricky, um, because you're, you're, it, it just, you know, I don't mind saying a lot of dialogue. I love, I'd love to say a lot, a lot of dialogue, but, um, there's also something beautiful about, uh, the space in between the words and the space in between uh, um, moments. And um, that was what was really fun about playing Jacob was just um, really deeply connecting to the internal dialogue of his reality. Um, you know, he's an immigrant and he's a first generation immigrant. So, you know, the language is a barrier for him. And um, he's also coming from a place of, you know, kind of a collectivist existence, anyhow, uh, of in a Korean, from a Korean background, and so he's he's also, you know, that that type of mentality is a little bit different than the way that we live here, which is very much like here's who I am. Um, from from Korea, the East, it's more like you probably already know who I am, or I'm fitting this box that you need me to fit in for the collective, and um, I think you know that type of existence. Um, is in some ways like you know this movie it's in some ways the ways that east and west miscommunicate and why they don't understand mm. each other. um and mm. i think that was the fun in playing that it was just it's a glance it's a look it's the shoulders it's yeah. uh, it's just the breathing um it's the way you sit and um approaching work from that point of view is always um it's it's scary because you don't know if anybody's going to see but um Isaac and good directors, really wonderful directors, they always see. And that, that was, I think, the liberating thing of like being able to be, uh, being able to work with really wonderful directors is that um, when you just submit and just kind of like get to be, they'll catch it. They'll, they'll, right. they'll catch it. Yeah. And, um, you know, right. it's, it's funny that you, you mentioned that, you know, in Darkest Hour, you know, you have all this, you know, the parliament, you have, I mean, is a wordsmith. He wrote more. Wo Churchill wrote more words than 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 you know Dickens and Shakespeare put together. <laughs> and so he's a, he was he's a talker. But someone asked me. They said, "What's your favourite scene?" And my favourite scene was uh, Churchill walking down a, a hallway and he hears Hitler broadcasting, and he turns back and closes the door shut mm -hmm. so that he can't. So he's closing, closing him out. Um, there's no dialogue. It, it's just, uh, it, it's, I just, I, just the physicality, the action, the intention, the thought, everything is in that, is in that, is in that quiet scene and this, and this voice off. And we all instantly recognize who it is. And uh, so it's, it's really, and, and the way that, that, um, that Joe Wright had just staged it, it's, it's a quiet moment and it's, and it's one of my favorites. And also working with, I've, I've had the pleasure of working with Morgan Freeman. And he's, he's a great one for saying, um, you know, I could do this one, one line and a look. I don't, I don't, I don't need, I don't need all this time. He said, I, I could do it. I could just do this with two words and a look. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it feels like sometimes. In my oh. experience, it's like, uh, sorry, uh, go ahead. Oh, okay. I, I, go ahead, please. I just was saying that like, you know, it's not really in my experience about like the words or not when an actor, 
um, or actress is is locked in and comfortable and has found the character in a deep and resonant way and isn't trying to sell you something. And I think Stephen, your point is is really good that like good directors know not to try to sell you something and great actors the same. And it is you have to be brave enough to take the risk to, as Gary said, be naked and let it, yeah. what happens happen. And when somebody like like the um, five actors I'm looking at now is as locked in in character in that performance, it's, you know, it doesn't matter if they're speaking or doing a 10 page monologue, there's Ooh. something embodied about it that is just working and alive. And that's really I, what I find so Im impressive about the actors th that I admire. There is something that is very hard to distinguish from a kind of magic about great acting and it involves a kind of inhabiting you know this the, another person and um you know that's that that's really where where it is i think for me yeah, yeah. i've been thinking about that a little bit oh sorry sasha you're gonna say i no i was just saying i i did um one of the films i did um this year was chicago seven and in that there were about three weeks where i was in a courtroom essentially listening so i was silent and you know being very very egotistical and a huge narcissist i obviously looked at the pages and was like you know aaron sorkin anyway you could write us a little bit more dialogue here some of that uh, award-winning dialogue and uh, <laughs> you, you know i was quite scared of you know firstly the cast for that is incredible and just to echo what ben and delroy have said i mean it's a great honor being on a Zoom here virtually with all of you, all of whose work that, you know, I've admired some of you for decades. So really, really honored. But so in that movie, it, it was, I was really sort of terrified about how will I be interesting and on when I'm completely silent for three weeks, essentially. I mean, and, and also the problem was the cast was so good that at times I was scared that I was going to turn into a spectator looking at this brilliant Aaron Sorkin play that I had front row seats at. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I also want to echo John. I was looking at your movie and I thought that's an incredible performance. And that the length of the, just technically the length of those speeches and the memory required um, so, I mean, I, I, you know, my experience was literally coming into it from the other side of being completely silent and then obviously active. But um, Just a quick follow-up for you, Sasha. I mean, I, I found it interesting that your two films this year, um, you know, my understanding is with Borat, yes, you do have an outline of, of what you're looking to do, but obviously there's quite a bit of improv in the moment. But then you go to Aaron Sorkin, who apparently you don't really change a word, um, just the if you can compare and contrast those experiences, because that's pretty dramatic polar opposites, I would think. So with uh, Borat, you know, with Borat, you know, there's there is a lot of line learning. There, you, you know, I'm rewriting the script continually, often until you know 30 minutes before we start shooting. So, you know, often I'll go into a scene and there can be 50 lines that have just been written that you have to kind of memorize and actually one of the scenes was five days long so with that there are you know pages and pages of dialogue that i'm trying to get in but then obviously you know with the scene that is you know one of the scenes is five days long and i'm with the other people for about 14 hours a day so you are you know i don't know what my maths is but that's about 70 hours of yeah, it's a 70 hour scene. So you've got to navigate your way through that scene and make sure you've got the usable lines in there. And then somehow Sorkin hires me and he wants everything to be precise. And my, my question to him on the first day was why me? Because I'm known for improvising. And obviously I was trying to pitch, you know, that I should uh, improvise and, but, I mean, the beauty of Sorkin's language is that it's perfect, you know, and I, I can't remember who said it, but it's sort of, you can make a bad movie with a great script, 
that you can't make a great movie with a bad script. And Sorkin, you are coming to it with a great script. So you have that safety net, you're already 60% there. You just have to bring the reality, your own flourish, you know, you know, the detail of character, but you are, the movie is going to be captivating, uh, you know, captivating whatever you do, not to diminish the incredible work all of you have done. But it, for me, there was that real security of knowing that I had a word perfect script. Um, but yes, it was, it, you know, obviously I pushed him and said, can I just do, because again, you were, you were saying like Ridley Scott in a, t you know, two or three takes and it's all done. We were, we were talking about prior to the Zoom. Uh, Aaron Sorkin, he gets it and he wants to move on. You know, sometimes it's one, two takes and I'd say, can I just try something a little bit different? You know, even if you end up not using it, because for me as quite a novel actor and I've done far less films than, you know, most of you. I've only done a handful of films really that I haven't written. Uh, for me, once the director is happy, that actually reduces so much stress that I can actually often do my best take because I know he's yeah. happy to be, you know, so I was just saying, please let me try one where I'm completely relaxed now. I know you've got what you want, but let me try and yeah. reinterpret that text. So I just, I, I know our time is short, so I want to wrap up with something that I think is just sort of a big picture question that other actors might find interesting. And that is how do each of you measure whether or not a project has been successful in hindsight? Um, uh, no, you know, to be honest, I, I used to have a, a different set of um, criteria. Uh, when I was younger, I wanted to impress people. I wanted to get the, job, the next job. As John David said, there's this thing inside us as actors that's always feel, there's no tenure. You know what I mean? There's no go watch. There's no, it, you know, you're only as good as your next job. The phone has stopped ringing uh, for more talented people than me i am you are constantly aware of that and there is this anxiety and pressure um and i you know a lot of times it used to be i want to be i want the movie to make money so that i can be seen as hireable by the studio i want it to be good because i want to Im impress these people that i admire and i want them to validate me and tell me that i'm good and i want to um be you know m uh, my father struggled to do this and i want to be able to do it uh, and not struggle and make a living. I, I, all kinds of things that I have tried over the years to use as measuring sticks. And what I've found, I was just talking to a really good friend of mine who does this too about this yesterday, is that I've just stopped doing all of that. And I just, there, there are like three or four really good friends who I love and respect, whose opinions really matter to me. And I want to show them the movie and I really hope they like it. And if they don't, I listen to them and I'll probably try to change it. Um, but mostly, and honestly, it's like, you know if it's good. You know if you did something interesting. You know if it was an interesting experience. You know if it was a valuable experience. You have your, it's not about what other people say. Or I mean, I suppose that's a cliche, but it, it just really isn't. Or how much money, I can't tell you why people buy tickets to some movies or others, or why some win awards or don't. Or, or I've, I've, I've vehemently agreed and disagreed with critics in equal measure. Um, I just know what I like. I know, you know, with, with, with Gone Girl, the experience of getting to know and, and love and be friends with David was the, I love the movie, but that was the most important part of it for me. Um, and, you know, there are personal little goals that I have and, and things that I'm trying to accomplish. And if I feel I've done that, I'm, I'm really trying. I'm not always successful. I'm still subject to feeling like, geez, everyone didn't hate that movie. You know what I mean? It's not a good feeling. Um, and it's nice when people like me, for sure. It's mostly because you get opportunity to, meet other really, you know, other extraordinary artists from whom you can learn. Um, I guess that's a very long way of saying I try to just set my own goals and have my own criterion and not worry too much because in this day and age, you're going to hear something different from everybody and everyone's voice is heard and it's a, a very cacophonous and ultimately, I think, a very crazy making way to try to echo locate. Like, how did that work? Delroy? I'm going to piggyback on that. It's a feeling for me. Uh, when I think about um, Bloods, how I felt about Bloods, it felt, it, I felt good inside of the work. And uh, 
it occurs to me that had the film come out and audiences had not responded to it, that would not impact how I feel about the process of how I feel about the process of making the work, how I felt as a result of um, making the work, and it, it it felt good. And I can say that about uh, when I did the cider house rules, I felt ah, this yeah this is all right. I absolutely felt it. Uh, uh, John David went when we worked on when your dad and I worked on Malcolm X. I'm very critical. I'm like everybody else, probably very critical of myself. However, with Malcolm X, I felt ah, I think we got something here. Um, so the the short answer is there's a feeling of satisfaction and accomplishment that is stronger than, however, the potential of however anybody else will respond. My own internal feeling is, is bigger than that. And it's not about arrogance. It's just a feeling of accomplishment that one has done one's job. I want to turn to Stephen because, and obviously, you know, give, give whatever answer you want, but I found in previously speaking with you that I got the sense that you felt probably as great about the movie, maybe at the Sundance screening, at the mm. end of it, maybe? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, there's there's a lot of ways to define success, like we said, and I, th I agree with everybody, or what Bell and Ben and Del Rey have said so far. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's also external factors, I think, you know, um, for it, I, I think I deem success beyond just like, the way that we try to understand it through money or how many people have seen it just like has it reached its intended purpose like has the has the thing you're trying to say from the film like gone out and said it and have people received it and um you know with this one um you know i'm still unpacking what the message overall is but i know like even in my kind of periphery it's ultimately like connection um, it's the humanity of seeing each other a little bit clearer. And, and you know, I sat next to my dad, um, like you're right. saying, I sat next to my dad at Sundance and I wasn't playing him, but, um, you know, there's a lot of ways in which I could never really access him um, because he also couldn't access me uh, through a lot of reasons. And um, for me to show, be able to show that, like, I understand him and I see him on a film at Sundance on a huge projection is insane in, in front of like hundreds of people. That's bonkers. And um, yeah, like that's, that's success in its own right. So I, I agree. It's, it's, it's an internal process and um, whatever is happening and however that comes out. And as long as it lands, I deem that successful. You know what, can I just add something, you know, in terms of what you were saying, Dan, about when you were younger and the various, criteria you would use to, to, to gauge success. And I'd be, as I was listening, I'd be terrified of doing that. I'd be terrified of having all of these external measuring sticks because it feels like that's a setup for failure. Because, you know, what happens if <clears throat> I do what I feel is really, really good work and some external force, a critic, whomever says, eh, well, you know what, fuck you. <laughs> You know, and to be, and to be, I'd be terrified of, of bequeathing that much external power to, to external forces. So it, it's, it's got to be about how I feel, how the film, feel, how my colleagues feel about what we've done. The, the only external force that I find me meaningful is, it's interesting as I'm reminded of, of, of Malcolm X, you know, as you guys are talking about it, it was such an important film to me as a young guy. It was the first time I ever saw a movie and walked out and thought, I want to be a better human being. Oh, wow. And, and hey, it, hey it have you ever told Spike like, that? Have you told Spike that? Yeah, well, I told Spike a lot of shit. I, I like to fuck with Spike and rarely give him compliments <laughs> because he just gives me shit. But it's, it's the truth. Yes, I have told him. It's, okay. it's, it's one of the most important films to me personally that I, because it changed the way I saw filmmaking and what films could do what they could actually inspire right. and that that's a goal so high that i i don't even dare aspire to it when people approach me and say a movie touched them in some way that is meaningful to me i am mindful that people are going to see it and i hope it does resonate with them so i'm not you know not without any awareness of like the you know the fact that it's ultimately for people to see i just think the only way that as you point out i can survive the process and really try to do my best work 
as if I hold myself to my own standards, keep them high, and if I meet them, allow myself to feel okay about it, and if I don't, be honest with myself that I, I really came up short and I need to find a way to do better. Let's go to Sasha. Yeah, I mean, you know, so I made the two movies that came out this year, Borat and Chicago 7. I felt I had to make those movies, right? I felt I couldn't really... So I stopped Borat to make Chicago 7. You know, there was a big debate in the production whether it was going to mean that we couldn't make our release date. I felt I couldn't look myself in the mirror on November the 4th if I didn't make Borat and Chicago 7. You know, Borat, and again, think about it, you know, you know, I'm turning to the crew and the director and a, a young Bulgarian actor and saying, listen, you are potentially risking getting arrested today or getting physically harmed or attacked or insulted. You know, there's got to be a reason why you're going through that. You know, I had to wear a bulletproof vest for two of the scenes. And the reason was I felt I had to get out that movie before the election to highlight, you know, the president's misogyny, corruption, and the dangerous slide into authoritarianism, and also the danger in conspiracy theories and lies that were being spread by social media and by the government, which I think we saw the effect of that in the attack on Washington. And then in terms of Chicago 7, I felt I had to make that as well because to me, it showed the importance of standing up to racism, to immorality and police brutality. And I wanted to inspire people to remind them of the power of peaceful protest, which we've seen this year in the Black Lives Matter movement and even the you know, there's, you know, that movie becomes more and more relevant. Even the, the insurrection that we saw in Washington, essentially those, whatever we want to call them, that mob were doing exactly what the Chicago Seven were tried for. They were crossing state lines to incite a riot, right? Which is what the seven or actually eight of the Chicago Seven were, were being tried for wrongly because they were actually just going across state lines to peacefully protest an unjust war. That was a mob who were intentionally aiming to violently protest and overturn a democratically elected president. So these were two movies, you know, the success to me is that I could look at myself in the mirror on November the 4th and, and say, I did everything I could do as an actor, as a writer, as a comedian, that I could do for this point in time. I, I, you know, if I hadn't done those two movies, then I think I'd be in a difficult place now. Mm -hmm. So that was that was the reason I, you know, you know, went did everything I could to come out of those two movies this year. Yeah, uh, John David. Um. I mean, everybody's pretty much said what I mean, how I feel. Um, I, uh, I, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, the shoulders I'm standing on, you know, like Adele Roy, you know, Spike Lee, you know, uh, uh, Denzel Washington, you know, I, I, I it's, 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 it's these, it's these kinds of films, what, what Malcolm X, what Glory did for me, what uh, Crooklyn does for me. Um, if, I, I won't be able to experience what success is for maybe another 20 years. So if, if the kind of performance, if I see this crazy dude in a movie called The Professional, I'm like, who, who the hell is this guy? Like, like and, and what, what De Niro does for me, you know, like if I can see, if I can, the way that made me feel makes me want to do this. If somebody tells me that in 20 something years and I'm like, okay, then I was successful. That was successful then. Um, but the, 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 the immediate success, I guess, is the fact that, um, um, I'm able to do what we get to do. You know, I love what I do, you know, and, uh, you know, we, we, we honestly just, we, we provide entertainment, uh, a form of escapism or something you can relate to in, in, in what we do. And if the people that are out there really fighting, that are on the front lines, fighting for equality, fighting for our right to be able to do this, to evolve in this industry and in the real world, then uh, if, if we can inspire them, then uh, honestly, that is a success right now that I can measure. That someone and somebody like that resonated with something uh, 
I said in the film, something we said in the film. Thanks. Gary, can you close us out? Yeah. Um, it, for me, it's, it, it's mostly about the experience. It, it's in the, I'm not so much concerned with the, the, the very end product. I like the journey. I like the creative experience. We're very, I mean, John David, you know, you're saying about success. I mean, you know, I think Coppola said, you know, success as an artist, he said, what is it? He said, it's luck and talent. I mean, I think, I, I think we're all, you know, if you, you guys are, are, are talented. And as Ben was, ben was talking about earlier, you know, there's a, there's a degree of, of luck in why we're sitting here <laughs> talking to you and, 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 and not others. But um, I love the crew. I love, uh, I love my fellow actors. Um, uh, Mank was a, an amazing ensemble and I just, I, I just loved every day. What, what better than waking up in the morning and going, God, I'm really, oh, wow, you know, the car here's early. Now yeah, well, I'll go, I'll get in it, I'm early. I want to get and see these people that I'm working with, you know. I really, I wake up in the morning, I feel so blessed that I am in a, a, a career where I wake up in the morning and I want to go into work. Amen. Yes. That, that, is, that is in itself such... Um, a, a blessing so working with those people you know on a, a and, and you know this material is good sometimes you know sometimes you don't always you're not always hitting high you don't hit them out of the park all the time but more often than not you will always you'll always work with someone who's interesting uh, meet people where as actors and um, and uh, and um, maybe maybe Sasha more than most, but I feel sometimes that I'm I'm I become like a detective, I'm an investigator, you know. I go off and find out about these about these people. That's the other aspect of it that I love. But just to wrap up, um, it you know I met I first met John David. Um, I was working with Denzel and. Uh, you were a football player then, a young, young football player. And, and here you are, you've become this incredible, just the town ooze, oozing out of your every pore. You've just become this, this great, uh, and I, I feel like we're all people, we're, in a, we're, we're, we're like links in a chain, you know, uh, Sasha is saying, well, he's got maybe a handful of movies. Well, you've got, you know, um, I'm looking at the back nine now, but uh, the, uh, but you're all just, uh, just, it's such a, such a pleasure to uh, just sit here and, 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 and chat with you. I've got, got, got such respect. And, and so we're links in a chain, you know, when it, we, maybe, maybe Delroy and I are, are you know, you know, we're all more doing it longer and a little closer in age, but we just kind of we're handing handing off the baton. So uh, you know, Stephen and Sasha and you, 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 and and God bless you, Ben. You know, you're still uh, you, you young men. You've got you've got uh, all, all all ahead of you. Well, I want to. Thank you for the great performances. And on behalf of the Hollywood Reporter, thank you so much for making the time to do this. It's really an honor to have all of you and uh, hope it wasn't too much of a, a grind. Really appreciate it. No, it's a pleasure. No, fantastic. Great to hang with you guys. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, likewise. likewise. Great. Please <laughs> respect it would be amazing. Hey, Thanks. John David, tell me I said, hey, here. Yeah. Say who? Your dad. Tell me oh, I oh, said, yes, hey. Sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, actually, my cousin was have been working with you in New Mexico. Yeah, so. I just found that out, man. I just found yeah. out that, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, it's going, it went great, so I'm looking forward to that, too. God bless y'all. Please say hello to Denzel. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> say hello to Dead Tail. I've never met him, but just say hello. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if he wants to, no, for me, <laughs> he probably wants to know I said hello. So just let him <laughs> I'll tell you what, John Dave, you don't have to wait for anybody to tell you, man. You're as fucking good as anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No fucking joke. For real. You are as good as anybody who does this, man. I am I I am really blown away. And um uh, so all the Thank best. You. Oh, you guys, it's since not we're, right. since we're getting uh, since we're giving compliments, I just want to say Steve talking about the silence. Um, and one of the most devastating, devastatingly powerful, and this is not to say that other actors did not have wonderful moments, but I gotta say, man, in your film, when um, your your wife, it looks as if you guys were gonna break up, and it was a scene between the two two of you all, and she talked, and the the manner you didn't say anything, and I felt everything. So just as an affirmation of the brilliant, brilliant, brilliant silences that you used, um, it was it was it was extraordinary, man. It was incredible. Thank you very much. That's a that's a great alcoholic, Ben. <laughs> hey, a lot of research, Gary. You gotta do your research in this business. You gotta work you hard. No, but I want to do all that know, drinking. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean the. Uh... No, I, I agree. Actually, there is this assumption that like um, the two don't necessarily go together. You know, like uh, the best uh, airline pilots uh, don't make the best airline pilots on TV. So you know what I mean? Like, yeah. All right, I gotta go. I'm I so sorry. Go. To... All right, stay safe, everybody.